Hey folks, Alan Mandic, Mandic really here, and this is a 3D printing workshop vlog. If you're not familiar, which this is only the second one of these I've done, so it's quite possible you're not, we're gonna work on some smaller projects that don't necessarily warrant their own dedicated video on various printers around the studio. In this one, we're gonna work on my Voron 2.4, Project Reanimator's probably gonna be the bulk of it, and first we're gonna start with the FL Sun B400. I unboxed this beast on stream last week, and overall it went really smoothly. The only hiccup we ran into was if you look at the height map data of the bed surface, it tells you that that thing is just warped up when it really isn't. My first layer laid down well, laying straight edge across the bed, it looks fine. So somebody who watched the VOD of the stream recommended I do a delta calibration on this machine, so we're going to do that. This is really straightforward because it's already in the menu system on clipper screen on the speeder pad. I go to configuration, bed level, calibration, then it asks me to connect the Z switch and then it magnetically attach it to the effector of the tool head. I hit continue and the machine probes seven points around the bed to calibrate the towers of the Delta so it knows where it's at. And now we can rerun a new mesh bed level. And look at that, when you actually calibrate something and then run the mesh again, it actually has a decent height map. I probably should have run the delta calibration before I ran the mesh bed level in the live stream, but I didn't know that at the time. And as part of that review, obviously I need to run the machine more so I can test it out. I wanna try doing a time lapse right now though. And I wanna try and do one with this, my Panasonic Lumix GH6 that is my primary camera. So let's hook it up. To do that, I'm gonna use this nothing special USB HDMI capture card off of Amazon that cost me like 15 bucks. Just plug it into a USB port on the speeder pad and I'll hook the HDMI cable on the other end to the camera. I'm trying out a new camera and audio setup for on the go vloggy type stuff. So please excuse if it looks or sounds a little off compared to other footage because the GH6 is now set up on the slider. I have to be extra when I'm filming a time lapse, of course. just like that, the Thing Print by JS Studio is done. Took just under two hours to print and overall pretty good results. So not bad for the first thing that I printed that wasn't a vase on the FL Sun V400. As far as the time-lapse setup is concerned, this little cheapy capture card can only do 1080p and the GH6 is outputting a 5.8K open gate 4x3 aspect ratio video, downscaling it to 1080 so this can accept it. And then for this video, I had to then re-upscale it to 4K. It really did not look good for a video like this. It turned out okay for the time-lapse on Instagram and TikTok, but here, not so much. I'm tempted to try something like an Elgato Camlink 4K and see if it'll work with the speeder pad and mainsail. I don't know, I kind of expect it won't, but might be worth a shot. Hold up there, Alan. Before you finish this video, you actually did pick up a Camlink 4K to try out. Tested it out on the speeder pad. I was able to get an image if I downsampled to 1080p on my GH6, but not 4K. This is 4K capable and it works going into my computer, but not into the speeder pad. So I tried it on my Voron 2.4 going into the Raspberry Pi 4 that that machine is running. And once again, I wasn't able to get an image out of it. It seems like maybe Mansail just can't pick up the 4K image off of this. I don't believe it's putting out an MJPEG stream off of this Camlink 4K. So that's probably part of the issue. I'm gonna have to look into actually triggering the time-lapse shutter functionality on my camera, which is gonna to lead to better quality time-lapses anyway. With all that done, we're done with the FL Sun V400. It's time to move on to the Voron 2.4. Side note, electric standing desk for a workbench. It's a little wobbly, but otherwise I adore it. It's easy to work at. I can stand, I can sit, I can move it up and down for taking product shots or things like this. My Voron 2.4 is up and running. I've done a total of one and a quarter prints with it so far. I don't think I'm gonna put the panels on it quite yet. I might end up converting this to CAN bus away from the full harness setup and cable chains. So I wanna have the room to work in here if I go to do that. But I do wanna button up the skirts and the wiring underneath. First thing I wanna deal with is there's supposed to be two 60 millimeter cooling fans blowing across the electronics box. I only have one currently because I robbed the second one for Project Reanimator some months ago. I picked up a replacement one, so let's get this thing in here. 
I'm using Noctua A6 X25 fans because I don't like loud fan noise and they're gonna do the job just fine for here. For installation on the Voron, we need to put some heat press inserts into the body of the fan so we can then screw it into the side skirt. I'm fairly sure these Noctua fans are probably glass filled nylon construction for the frame because I can just kind of like feel a crunchiness as I'm inserting the heat press insert into them and it definitely takes a fair amount of heat to do it. For this particular application, I'm gonna use the existing harness already attached to here and keep as much of the wire as I can. It's already got the sleeving on here, so if I can maintain that, I will. In this particular application with this three wire knock to a fan, I don't need the yellow wire. That is my tack signal, so away that goes. Once the wires are stripped, I can crimp on the terminals that they need and then slide on a little heat shrink and seal that up to give it a nice clean finish, followed by connecting the JSTXH two pin connector I need. A very important side note real quick for you folks, my helper is, is being so helpful right now. Snoozle. Jekyll. Huh? Jackie dude. What? Jekyll. Father leave me alone. Installation of this fan is very straightforward, it just slips into the skirt area. There's a grill that goes on here with a couple of recesses to match the skirt. I just need to snake the wire into place and plug it into a fan port. The Voron diagram has you splice the two fans together. As I'm running an octopus pro board with plenty of fan connectors, I don't need to do that. Also with this board, I can use five, 12 or 24 volt fans. I just need to set the jumper appropriately. In the middle will give me 12 volt for this knock to a fan. I just went to move to the next step of putting this next side skirt on and I realized why I haven't done it previously. It's because when I got to that point, I realized I didn't have the parts printed already. So I need to print two more parts for this skirt. Luckily, I do have a Voron to print the parts with. As I haven't really tuned this machine yet, I need to do at least some basic tuning before I go printing these parts. I'm starting with the flow rate test and I'm actually using the Soft Fever Fork of Bamboo Studio for this and they're testing. Print a handful of these chips and look what one has the best result. This negative five looked okay, but the base layer was pretty thin. The negative four looks as good as the negative five on top, but the base layer is well filled in. So I'm going with that. That's gonna be a 96% multiplier for extrusion with this Polymaker ASA. Next up is pressure advanced tuning. I tried the soft fever calibration for that as well, but I wasn't happy with it. So I moved to the default clipper tuning tower and the default model. Measure the height where it looks the best for me, and that's gonna give me the pressure advance value for this particular filament. With the filament calibration dialed in, I can throw the enclosure on top of the machine and get to printing these parts. It's kind of rad to see the LEDs lighting up the print area as this thing gets printing inside of its little sound blanket, moving blanket enclosure. I have to say my initial impressions of printing with my V2.4 are really positive. I need to tune more. It's got some issues like adhesion issues on this print in particular with a slight minor layer shift because of that adhesion issue curling up the part. But honestly, that's because I'm printing ASA without an enclosure and didn't bake a chamber to print this. With the skirt parts printed, I'm ready to install them on the machine, line them up where they need to be, insert the screws and tighten them down. Then there's a couple of blank fan grill pieces go in place on the left side of the machine since there are no fans installed on this side. I could put them there if I really wanted to, but I don't feel a need to at the moment at least. And now it's time to move on to Project Reanimaker. If you haven't seen the build and overview video for this MakerBot replicator I converted to Core XY, there's a link up here. I highlighted some of the issues I had with this machine in that video and we're gonna address them now. We're gonna start by replacing the A and B motors, which currently are the original MakerBot motors and they were running really hot. So I had to dial down the amperage on them just to keep them from melting the mounts that they're attached to. And so we're going to some 0.9 degree LDO motors. Also replacing the pancake stepper for the extruder with an LDO one because this one was skipping steps when I was really trying to push it. I wanted to start with the motors, but I need to get the belts off. So I need to get the carriage disassembled because that's where the clamp for the belts is. Luckily I designed this carriage assembly. So the entire tool head, actual extruder, hot end fans can all be removed with just three screws and it's out of my way so that I can get to the belt clamp to get the belts off. This is the new carriage piece that I'm going to be installing in here. It has tighter tolerances than the old one. See the previous video to see the tolerance issues I ran into. Now I just need to install the handful of heat press inserts that are required for this design so that the carriage 
and tool head can be screwed together. This clips onto the three linear bearings that I'm using for this particular configuration, and it is so much tighter than the previous tolerances were. This is way better. Now with the belts out of the way, I can actually get the old motors off and out of the machine. I'm gonna reuse these pulleys on the new LDO motors so they have to come off of the old motors. Here's a quick pro tip for you when you are working with connectors you're gonna be disassembling. I wanna sleeve these wires so I took some pictures of the connectors and the wire orientation before disassembly so I can easily reassemble them in the correct order without having to guess. I use PET braided sleeving to sleeve the wires on the new LDO motors and begin cable management, which is gonna be fun to redo pretty much everything on this machine. With the AB motor swapped, it's time to deal with the extruder motor. This is again, fairly straightforward. I have a cable management piece on the back side of the extruder that I just need to remove so that I can get the motor off of the micro Sherpa extruder that I'm running. The new LDO motor, of course, fits directly back in place because, well, this is a NEMA 14, it's not that big a deal. While I have the tool head out, let's take a look at something I didn't show in the previous video. The actual part cooling fan duct is mounted directly to a couple of threaded holes in the side of the Drop Effect XG hot end that are probably intended for mounting the hot end to something, but I use them to mount my part cooling duct. I also made this air scoop duct that takes the air from the heat sink itself that blows across it and ducts it up and away from the print area and across the extruder motor to help cool it off a little bit. Will it actually cool? I don't know. It is going to be warm air, but at least it's not blowing down around the print area. Now I can do some cable management on the tool head. I'm going to mount it back to its carriage assembly and move it to the furthest point away from its strain relief cable management at the back of the machine. That way I know exactly how long my wires need to be at the most extreme point. I used heat shrink to cable manage this instead of zip ties so that it was a more strain relieving design and I used extra long pieces of heat shrink at each end of the cable management to again create strain relief. Now with the fun of straightening out all the wires in the electronics box underneath of this thing, I had to go back and redo a bunch of stuff that I rushed through getting this thing ready to take to Earth 2022 so I could actually clean things up a little bit nicer this time. I ended up extending the wires on the LDO extruder motor. This is something I run into with pretty much every manufacturer of 3D printer parts. Even on this machine, which is relatively small overall, I just didn't have enough wire length. I needed like six more inches, so I had to extend those wires. And then I was able to refer back to that picture that I took earlier to know exactly how to pin them into the connector and not be tripped up and have to look it up online or whatever. This is what I ended up with for cable management. It's not the prettiest thing I've ever done by any means, but I know where everything is. It's fairly color coded so I can identify the wires as I need and address them later on if need be. Now we can actually deal with the belts and motor pulleys. This belt here, I'm tossing. That was a cheap Amazon one that I just had to use to get this thing together. It's mostly rubber and not a Gates belt and it's terrible. As far as setting pulley height is concerned, I didn't design any tools or anything. I'm pretty much just eyeballing it off of the idler pulleys that are at a fixed height. And I'll adjust this once I get the belts in place, seeing how the belts want to ride. Belt routing on this machine is as annoying and confusing as any other Core XY, but once you get a few of those under your belt, this is pretty straightforward to route the belt. No pun intended. I've got the carriage assembly all the way to the front of the box. That way I can use that to help me square things up. I'm gonna pull as much slack out of the belts as I can now. I have the tensioners for the motors all the way loosened so that I can use them to adjust later. With the slack taken up, I install the belt clamp so I can check things. Next, I'll move the carriage around through its motion. That way the belts can run through the pulleys around the motors and free up anywhere they might have been like a tooth off or something like that. After doing that, I do feel I have a little more slack than I care for, so I'll use a pair of needle nose pliers holding the belts in place, lightly, just ever so lightly loosen up the belt clamp, and then twist the needle nose pliers while still holding on to the belts, and it'll act as kind of a pulley system to pull the teeth through their catches on the belt clamp and then tighten up the system a little more. For now, I'm gonna leave just a little extra length on the back of these belts where they're sticking out of there so I have plenty left to grab onto if I feel that I need to make any further adjustments. I'll do a few prints, let the belts break in a little bit and see where I'm at. I also have plenty of adjustment left on the tensioners that I built into the system, which are just the motor mount plates being able to be slid back to pull more tension on the belts. And then I can finally, one last time, install the tool head onto the carriage. 
At this point, I am so very happy that I designed this system to only have three bolts to remove that tool head and be able to work with this carriage and access those belts and the belt clamp. It makes servicing this whole setup so much easier. Now I'm ready to power this thing on and I can dive into Clipper and make the few reconfigurations that I need to, such as increasing my motor amperage from that pathetic 0.5 amps that I was at to the new 1.1 amp RMS for these LDO motors and resetting my rotation distance for the 0.9 degree motors. With those config changes out of the way, it's time to start printing some stuff. I haven't printed much PLA with this machine yet, so I started off doing a little bit of flow rate calibration and pressure advanced tuning. And quite honestly, that's about all I did with this thing before I decided to see how fast I can print a Benchy. I sliced that Benchy in the soft fever fork of Bamboo Studio, where I created a profile for this machine based off of Voron V0, which is what I did in Prusa Slicer as well for this. And this beautiful black boat printed in just 22 minutes and 55 seconds. There's definitely some ghosting artifacts and a little bit of cooling issue on the bow. Only having a single 5015 part cooling fan is not helping me a lot here, but honestly, it turned out better than I expected. Soon I'm gonna design an ADXL mount for this so I can tune input shaper on this machine and try and improve quality. But right now I just wanna see, can I push the speed a little higher? Can I print an under 20 minute Benchy on a wooden box printer. So I jumped into Slicer and did some tuning and tweaking to try and speed things up. I increased acceleration, I changed infill, I changed top layer and bottom layer fill types. These all saved me a little bit of time here, a little bit of time there. Then I set the printing and had a decent layer shift halfway through. But that was a 17 minute flat benchy, it just wasn't a success. So I dove into my config and made a few changes and printed a 16 minute and 33 second 0.21 benchy. It's by no means a pretty benchy, but it does conform to the rules of the speedboat challenge. It uses a 0.25 millimeter layer height, 10% infill, 0.45 millimeter extrusion width, and is printed in PLA. And if you're curious about how I didn't get a layer shift on this one while actually going faster than the previous one, I bumped up my motor current to 1.25 amp. I wouldn't want to run that on a daily basis, and actually they weren't that hot to the touch, but that's what I ran just for this quick test and I turned off Stealth Chop. I went back to Spread Cycle, and I think that's probably the bigger thing that kept my motors from skipping steps. With the fun of a couple of fast prints out of the way, it's time to start tuning that thing in for quality, but that's for another day. I am seeing with that new configuration that I think that machine is gonna end up being a good quality printer in the end, and I only really built it for the heck of it. One last note on Reanimaker, the design files were not previously released for that as I said I would, I wanted to confirm a few adjustments that I made to them in the real world before I released the files. I have now confirmed those and you can find a link in the description down below to all the design files for that machine so you can make one of these for yourself or just download my designs. They're free to you and it does help support the channel. So maybe you can open these up in your CAD of choice and learn from the way that I design things. Now I've got to get back to the studio revamp for 2023. I've got more work to get done around here and I actually added a bunch more to my plate at this point. I hope you found this video interesting, folks. If you did, drop it a like, it really helps out. Let me know in the comments, what do you think about these workshop vlogs? You wanna see more of these little projects that I have to get done anyway? Let me know in the comments down below. Get subscribed to keep up to date with all the videos yet to come and to ensure your 3D prints don't fail. It's not a guarantee, but it can't hurt.